this one and then the Chief Digital Officer. We encourage anyone taking part in the discussion on social media to use the hashtags Assembly Economy, London Tourism and Digital London. First, we're going to have a few items of formal business to go through before we come to our guests. So first, um, do we have any apologies for this meeting? Thank you. Yes, we've received apologies from Assemblymember Arnold and Assemblymember Bailey, for whom Assemblymember Arbon will be substituting. Thank you. Can I ask members to note the list of appointments set out at item two and ask if members have any other interests to declare? No. No other interests? Thank you. Um, can we confirm the minutes from our last meeting, which was held on the 10th of October 2017? Have agreed. agreed. Thank you very much. And can we note the outstanding list of actions? I did. Thank you. And that brings us to today's first discussion item, which is on London and Partners. Um, the topics to be, discovered, to be covered in this discussion are an overview of the London economy, priorities for London and Partners, and the tourism vision for London. And can I now welcome our guests. Uh, we have Rajesh Agrawal, Deputy Mayor for Business, Deputy Chair of the London Economic Action Partnership, and Chairman of London and Partners, and Andrew Cook, who is the Chief Operations Officer for London and Partners. Welcome to both of you. Um, First, a question um, for both of you um, to take in turns. Um, what is your assessment of the current state of London's economy? <coughs> the, um, <coughs> London, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting us here uh, and good morning to all of you. See, London's economy is still sort of doing well uh, because the core strengths of London still uh, remain the underlying strengths. Um, but Brexit causes a huge risk, it, it poses a huge risk. Um, and especially uh, exaggerated by the lack of clarity uh, from the government. Um, there have been some investments coming in post-referendum, uh, big investments like from uh, Google and uh, Apple and, and so on. But a lot of these investments were from the um, uh, pipeline which, uh, uh, which existed from before uh, the referendum. So whilst it's a vote of confidence in London's economy, um, we are quite focused on the future investments um, and the potential impact of current uncertainty that we are having uh, across the board. I know London Partners is working very hard to make sure uh, that the pipeline is maintained of FDI um, and uh, that the, uh, they've consistently achieved good results, but we need some urgent action from the government uh, to support continuing FDI. But that is why the mayor and I have called upon, uh, uh, have been calling for a status quo transition deal uh, since before the beginning of the negotiations. And that is why we believe that continued membership of the single market is the best way to guarantee business confidence and that uh, uh, so that London businesses can have access uh, to the largest export market. Uh, which is the EU and the dynamic workforce that the EU uh, uh, market uh, offers. So since the Brexit, the Mayor has done a lot of work around this. We've got a Brexit Experts Advisory Group, uh, which we uh, draw regularly uh, advice from. Uh, the Mayor also regularly meets uh, David Davis, Secretary of State for uh, Brexit, to highlight and discuss the concerns of uh, London businesses and of different key sectors uh, within businesses um, and uh, he's also accompanied by experts uh, from the Brexit Experts Advisory Group in these meetings uh, as well. <coughs> so, so far he's highlighted uh, sectors like the higher education, creative industries uh, and so on. And by and large, uh, I mean, Brexit affects different sectors in different ways. But across all sectors, uh, people are concerned, businesses are concerned around access to talent. And that is why the mayor has uh, called for a qualified freedom of movement of people um, so that people, uh, so that businesses can still access the workforce from the EU, which is a very, very important part of their business. Um, <clears throat> There's also a big risk of job losses in a more sort of heavily, heavily regulated sectors such as financial services and life sciences. 
and some of these businesses are quite big, and hence they're quite sort of dependent on um, clarity from the government so that they know how the business is going to proceed thereafter. Um, so. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to add anything to that, just in terms of the, you know, the, the current state of London's economy? I mean, this is, clearly Brexit is a massive shadow um, o o over what, what's happening, just in terms of that uncertainty that Rajesh was talking yes. about. Yes, so I suppose fo focusing on, on the areas that we have responsibility for in terms of attracting business students and um, tourism to, to, to London. Um, so clearly, uh, tourism is holding up well, largely because of the devaluation of the pound. Um, so we are seeing record levels of international tourists coming to London. So second quarter, um, up 10% compared to, to last year. So whilst there was a small dip in demand from domestic tourists following the security um, incidents earlier in the year, that has now recovered, and as I say, international tourism is 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 doing very well. Um, but a lot of that is 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 due to, due to the pound. So how long that <coughs> will continue is is um, I suppose a question mark there. Uh, certainly, from from a business perspective, uh, actually we are still seeing investment coming into London. So in terms of uh, we have a target of, of securing around two hundred companies coming to London this year, around four thousand jobs. We've, we've met that 4,000 jobs target already, but a lot of those companies were already in our pipeline, so they were already had made their decisions or were planning their decisions um, uh, pre-Brexit. We are, though, seeing a softening in our pipeline going forward, though, so um, down at around 17-18% um, compared to last year. So... Um, Certainly, Brexit is is cause for concern. It is causing concern with with companies. Um, anything that causes uncertainty uh, is will have an impact. And what we're seeing is that a lot of companies are putting their decisions on on hold at, at the moment um, and are waiting for greater clarity in terms of what Brexit means. Um, but they can't continue waiting for forever. And um, I think what we're seeing, if there isn't a some clarity over, over what the Brexit deal and transition arrangements might be by the end of the year, then um, they will need to make, make some decisions, which may mean moving stuff um, out of London. Yeah, which would potentially be <coughs> yeah. tough for, for, for London and Londoners. I gather that both Fiona and Andrew want to come in at this Andrew point. Indicate to on, on Brexit, I've got, I've got two points I'd like to probe with you, Rajesh. The first is you've talked a lot about what the Mayor's arguing for. Are those arguments getting any traction with government, or are they simply putting up the shutters? It seems like the so the meetings that the mayor is having with David Davis. It seems like the Secretary of State is actually listening, uh, but it also seems that the government is very divided uh, and uh, uh, reacting really slowly. Yeah. When the writing is on the wall, if you speak to businesses, which I've done hugely in last uh, uh, since, since I was appointed. Um, it's very clear that they need access to the single market. It's very clear they need access to the EU uh, talent. And in order to adjust, um, they will also need the transitional arrangement for status quo. Um, but it seems like it has come quite late in the day when the sort of government has actually started proposing transitional arrangement. Well, Andrew's already indicated the drop in uh, foreign direct investment. The second issue I wanted to raise was the risk of a no-deal Brexit, which is certainly something that's been talked about. <coughs> Are you doing any modelling of what the impact of a no-deal Brexit would have on London's economy? Well, we think it's the sort of worst-case scenario. Yeah, it is the uh, worst-case scenario, but, yes. and I would agree with you about that. Um, others may not. But are you actually modelling what the impact would be on London's economy if there was a no-deal Brexit? Well, I, the, the, the government is obviously uh, doing a sort of work around that and we have to sort of prepare for all sort of, sorts of uh, eventualities. Um, in terms of uh, <coughs> modelling, we think still everything is sort of up for negotiations and that's why we've been uh, talking about access to the single market, continued access to the uh, continued membership of the single market, which I think will is the best way to mi mitigate any kind of risk. Uh, well, I, agree, I agree with you. I agree with you about all those things. You know, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm an anti brexiteer myself, as originally Remain, although we are where we are. But that's not really answering my question. The question is, 
no deal Brexit is very much potentially on the on the agenda as one of the potential <coughs> options. I agree from my perspective it would be the worst case scenario. But as it is the worst case scenario, is the GLA through you actually modelling what the impact would be of that on London so that whatever mitigation measures we can take are thought about in advance? Or are we just sticking our uh, you know sticking our fingers in ears and hoping it doesn't happen? Um, because if <coughs> Bearing in mind, we've, we've got only 18 months or so to go now uh, until the Brexit um, mm. shutters come down. If we're not thinking about the worst case scenario, we could find ourselves in, in, in a real mess if we haven't modelled it. I mean, it may be, it is a contingency plan, as it were, but what contingency planning, what modelling is being done in case it is an ideal Brexit? So the, uh, we've been speaking to businesses a lot around it to understand their concerns and what their uh, view is. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, Deputy Governor of the Bank of England has already uh, said that if uh, by Christmas uh, there is no clarity by the, from the government on how things will proceed, uh, the jobs will start to uh, move. Uh, so I understand the sort of GLA economics has been working on uh, some of these things as to what is the sort of worst case scenario, how bad would it be? I think I understand they've been working on that. Yeah, but well, that's the point. I mean, Andrew's already made the point about what will happen um, to work with that foreign direct investment if there aren't is the clarity by the end of the year, and I, and I think it's unlikely there will be, bearing in mind how slow the negotiations have been going, but maybe there won't. The but it's it still come back to the, the question I put to you, okay, GLA may be modelling some of it, but is there any comprehensive work being done about what the overall impact would be, medium and long term? Well, there have been different work done by a lot of different organisations. I think this, uh, this, so I think you need to sort of collate all of that and look at it in, in as, a, as a sort of big picture. And this, the impact is very sectoral as well. It affects certain sectors more than the others. So we've been doing a lot of work with different sectors uh, to understand what is the sort of worst case scenario. So, for example, uh, in the aviation sector, I mean, in in a normal sort of sector. <clears throat> if uh, the worst case scenario is that it falls back on the WTO rules. In aviation sector, there is no fallback. Uh, so if we are unable to strike a deal and there's a no deal scenario, it means that a lot of planes won't be able to fly. Well, fine. Uh, and I agree with you, it's sectorial in impact, direct impact, but the indirect impact of one sector getting into trouble will have an, a, an indirect impact on the economy as a whole. Which is why I come back to the, the point prime point I'm putting to you is, is work being going on to pull together an overall picture of what the impact would be on London's economy? Yes, I understand the, the GL economics have been working on that. Thank you. My, uh, my question also relates to um, the context of a, of a sort of no-deal Brexit scenario, uh, which is um, uh, around the status quo transition <coughs> and the idea of transition in the context of having no deal. Um, by default, and the business organisation um, uh, representative said this to me last week, I've been trying to find whether it's actually sort of something they've said publicly. By default, if you don't have a deal, you can't have a tra transition based on a deal. So um, that's one scenario that I think, I mean, you've already mentioned sort of the planes and the issue around aviation. Um, but the the impact of not having a deal would also be that you couldn't have a transition towards a deal. Um, was the scenario that was sort of laid out for me last week, and I just wondered whether you could comment on that. Yeah, that would be absolutely terrible, and also the uh, the time frame that the government uh, has set itself of two years transition, uh, I think is very arbitrary. Mm -hmm. uh, the mayor and I believe that we should, however long it takes, we should sort of try and aim for that. Um, and then early signals on the transitional uh, arrangement, first of all, how, uh, would have been very helpful. And what, how the transitional period would look like, would it be status quo or not, there's sort of still sort of a lot of lack of clarity on that. It's not very clear as to how uh, it would potentially look like. Um, and, and that would be quite uh, disastrous for London. What kind of length of time would you envisage? Because two years is, is um, I mean, it's, it's coming up for t um, 18 months or so since the original vote. So two years actually in the scheme of things isn't very long. What kind of time frame would, would you argue would be a reasonable time for transition for London? Well, again, it's, uh, I think we should not set ourselves arbitrary uh, timeline. There's a lot uh, in play. It's a very, it's a sort of fast-moving situation. And whilst Brexit is... 
uh, our top priority here. It, it may not be the top priority in Europe. Mm. Um, and uh, that's why we should allow ourselves as a, however long uh, it takes as opposed to having set up, setting ourselves in arbitrary time frame. Okay. Um, Tony <coughs> and Susan both want to come in on this one. Susan, do you want to go first and then Tony? Um, I'll be very quick because I'm you. mindful of how many questions yes. we've got. First of all, can I just say thank you, Andrew, for being balanced because whenever I hear from, from um, senior Labour members, all I ever hear is it's the government here and the government there. The mayor has got substantial sums of money that he can look to put into um, interactions that are going to help businesses. We mustn't lose the fact that we are that unemployment is falling. That you said that we've got new companies coming in. Let's start talking London up. London's an incredible city, and actually, with the money that the mayor's got at his disposal, and the um, and and the bright spots we've got all around, we can make things happen. Let's not just sit back and constantly blame the government for everything. It, it's ridiculous. I hope in the next questions coming up, you're going to start to tell us what you're going to do to make things better <coughs> in London. Because that is, after all, what the GLA is here for, not to just constantly have a go at the, ma at the government. Do you... Is that no, a no, statement no. or is there a question? It, it's a statement. because I'm Okay, in which case I will move swiftly on to um, Assemblymember Arthur. I suppose it's related to that. Deputy Mayor, you... Uh, uh, exceedingly pessimistic phrases you use like it's a huge risk their writing is on the wall uh, don't you think there are huge opportunities from brexit for london i think uh, we, london has got some underlying strength which are fundamentals of london are very strong uh, and i think uh, we've been trying to maintain a very very sort of positive posture so i'm very confident about london's future but at the same time we cannot we should not be closing our eyes uh, on the risk it, it poses we must not disregard uh, all the risk that the brexit poses so i'm very confident that you know we speak to sort of businesses and and talk london up all the time when you uh, have all the time but you haven't this morning you haven't been talking london up at all and in fact the policy of this building and i see it on lots of people's badges uh, that they wear around the, around the building. London is open for business. There's never been any suggestion that London was closed to business. Um, it's exactly um, as has been said by Assemblymember Hall, the London economy um, in terms of generating jobs has never been more successful. We've heard Mr Cook talking about um, uh, strength in tourism. There is still uh, strength in um, undergraduates wanting to come uh, into London, uh, that's uh, growing in a, in a way that it has never been uh, growing before. It's also a fact, isn't it, that the number of tourists who come here from Europe is a fraction of the total tourist trade. The same applies to education, the same applies to inward investment. Much of the investment from financial institutions, where I agree with you, uncertainty is the problem. It's not risk which is the problem. No matter which way it goes, once it's settled, London is still going to be the most incredible magnet. Would you agree with that? Well, uncertainty in itself is a risk uh, that businesses perceive, and that is why the, it could lead to job losses. It's, 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 it's very clear that the businesses, if and, and the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England himself has said that by Christmas, if we don't see more clarity or businesses don't get more mm -hmm. certainty, we'll start seeing the jobs uh, well, being I would, moved. I would hope to hear <coughs> economics really is a better forecaster than the Bank of England. The Bank of England uh, has been an appalling forecaster uh, in relation uh, to Brexit. The economics department here uh, under the previous administration turned out to be correct. It was much more optimistic about what was going to happen. Now there has been a change in uh, economic advisers, i.e. <laughs> you replacing Gerard, uh, has meant a complete difference in view of the future of London. Most people, I think most Londoners, uh, I'll ask you if you agree with this, most Londoners accept this is going to happen one way or the other and they don't look on it with gloom, they look on it as being an opportunity. Would you agree with that? Well, I think uh, we should all look at it uh, with, op uh, with optimism and opportunity, but at the same time we should not disregard uh, the risk that Brexit poses and the uncertainty it brings. As a businessman myself, I, I understand 
the, uh, you, you, I totally understand business's point of view. If they, you know, whether they are considering to expand the business, whether they are looking to take new initiatives, uh, they will look at the market conditions. And if I do want to move us on, because well, we're still well, on the well, first well, yes, question. I, I, I understand that. But the truth of the matter is that Brexit isn't the risk. It is uncertainty which is causing the problem. And Brexit is causing uncertainty. Right. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I think we can all agree about the uncertainty. Um, I'd like to take us back to something a bit more sort of practical. Um, I'm just wondering which sectors of London's economy you are communicating with on a regular basis. And is that um, formal communication with those sectors or is it more sort of informal sort of through you know, dinners and things like that? So uh, there's, a whole, uh, there's a huge amount of business engagement uh, from, uh, the, from the mayor and from myself uh, with all, across all different uh, sectors. And we are using business engagement through, um, uh, we are doing it through, uh, so whether it's one-to-one -one, uh, meetings directly with the uh, business leaders, uh, but also through a lot of events, a lot of roundtables, um, and uh, sort of smaller events and larger events and also, of course, through the industry bodies uh, like the London Chamber of Commerce and Federation of Small Businesses and the IOD uh, and CBI and, and so on. Um, just, I mean, I'm sort of happy to give some numbers, but just in the last six months alone, I've had about 70 one-to-one -one meetings with uh, business leaders. I've spoken at about 30 different uh, uh, sort of uh, events. Um, I've attended over 30 events as well, business business events, and then uh, attended or chaired uh, over eight business board meetings, including uh, LBB, uh, BAB, which is the Business Advisory Board, um, and 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 the and the LEAP as well, which also has uh, business members in it. And it has been across through sort of different sectors, financial services. Uh, so, for instance, banking and financial services. I also sit on the board of the City UK, which is the prime industry body uh, as the mayor's representative. Can I, can I ask, are you also taking the pulse from the sort of small and medium enterprises the, um, you know, and the micro businesses who are, you know, sort of pretty much part of the engine of London's resilience as, as an economy, um, though, you know, those small <clears throat> Businesses, are you are you taking the pulse from them? Are you yes, uh, we are uh, talking to. I mean, you are absolutely right. SME businesses are the lifeblood of London's economy, employing fifty percent people. Ninety nine point eight per, uh, percent of all the businesses mm. in London are SMEs. We are engaging with them uh, directly. One day I woke up at four in the morning and went to New Covent Garden Market talking to the uh, uh, fruit and vegetable wholesalers mm. uh, there as well. Um, and uh, engaging through federation of small businesses. Uh, they are being affected by a number of things around Brexit, but also domestic things like the business increase in business rates uh, that they are facing. Um, so we are engaging with them in a lot of different ways. Thank you. I'm going to um, let... Um, sorry, is it Susan taking over the next bit? Yes, I'm going to hand over to Susan, who's going to move on to some questions which are um, on London Partners and, and the tourism vision. Thank you. Um, the GLA has recently completed a review of LMP's funding. What are the recommendations you will need to implement? And what difference will all these changes make to the way you work? OK, so the, the review was um, looking quite holistically at, at London and Partners in terms of um, our activities and whether we're value for money and, and where we should be focusing in the, in, in the future. Um, so as a, as a result of uh, that review, um, we are developing a new corporate strategy, a new three-year strategy, which will look at uh, where we should be focusing our, our activities in, in the future and the outcomes that we really want to see for, for London. Um, so that is, is clearly continuing to be job, jobs and growth, um, but very much focusing on the Mayor's agenda of good growth, um, so ensuring that... Uh, our activities uh, focus on the key sectors that are in the economic development strategy, of uh, which tourism is, is now highlighted as, 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 a, as a key sector within the EDS, uh, the draft EDS. Um, uh, looking at ensuring that tourism is, is sustainable so that it does benefit London and, and Londoners, and in fact all of our work is, is, is benefiting London and, and Londoners. 
um, a, a number of cities uh, internationally are, are struggling with over tourism. We don't think we're at that stage yet, but our tourism vision talks about uh, a 30% increase in, in tourists. I'm sorry, I um, mistakenly said we were discussing the tourism vision. We should be on the business plan with these questions. So right. The tourism vision in detail will be coming okay. up later in the meeting. I apologise, that was my mistake because okay. I did the handover. Sorry, but, you, but, but, but keep going. I'm, so. I'm, I'm hanging on everyone. <laughs> I, I, was, I just was worried about the tour, getting into okay. too much detail on the tourism vision. <laughs> Uh, clearly responding to Brexit <coughs> is, is, is in, important. Um, so, uh, as we, ha we have agreed that uncertainty is, is, is an issue, so how we respond to that. So we were focusing more of our activity on, um, on, on how we do that. So we have created a Be Brexit task force, so we have uh, diverted some of our resources from attracting new investment to protecting existing investment. So talking to companies that are already here, understanding their issues, reassuring them of London's inherent strengths um, and supporting them in, in their growth. We have created two new programmes over the last 18 months. One is the Mayor's International Business Programme, so an export programme uh, targeting scale-up companies um, of, with revenues of around a million pounds plus. Uh, so this, this really uh, augments some of the government uh, trade support policies which, which really are just about getting, make, raising awareness of trade. This is really about providing practical advice to companies in terms of how they trade with, so working with businesses, working with companies that are, are already trading and providing mentoring to those companies. So, so far, 360 companies have been through that program. Um, so, they come in, in in cohorts of 50 at a time. Um, and we run trade missions with the mayor and the deputy mayor. We've run 17 trade missions since, um, since uh, Brexit. And the additional program we're looking at is a business growth program, which is really about supporting uh, London SMEs, be they foreign-owned or, or indigenous um, and providing them with, uh, again, with mentoring support and focusing on the key barriers to growth. So that's talent, uh, finance and how they find funding, uh, which markets they should be focusing in and how they can um, uh, augment their sales and looking at, at their own brand, branding and marketing activities. Okay, I mean, you, you talk about a new corporate strategy coming. Uh, when, when will that be available for us to look at? So, um, we uh, expect that to be ready early, early in the, 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 the new year. We have a, a new chief executive who's currently on maternity leave. Uh, Laura Citroen will be back from maternity leave in, in January, so she will then be, will be finalising that, that strategy with, with her on her return, but at the moment we're working through the deta detail of that. And that will have proper performance indicators in, in it, will it? Because so uh, most, many of these strategies coming out don't have any... Performance most definitely, and we've, we've we focused a lot of effort in, in terms of our metrics and measurements, and making sure that they are best best in class. So we've worked with GLA Economics in terms of ensuring that our, our core measure of, of gross value added is is focused on the additional uh, value add which our our intervention makes. Um, through carrying out robust surveys with with tourists or students, and actually capturing feedback from companies in terms of how many jobs they're going to be creating, etc. So, yeah, we think we're pretty robust in terms of our measurements. Um, your 1718 business plan sets out significant shifts in funding streams over this year. So what's the thinking behind the changes? It's main, mainly in terms of this, this response to, to, to Brexit. So um, putting uh, more funds into uh, retaining companies boosting these, these new programmes, the Mayor's International Business Programme and Business Growth uh, Programme. So they are funded uh, through ERDF funding um, and then some private sector funding as, as well. So the, the International Business Programme has the likes of KPMG, BDO um, and, and, and other businesses supporting that in terms of them providing mentoring advice to, to those companies. Okay. You're going to spend uh, nearly a million pounds on the London Growth Network to support SMEs. So what practical help are you going to um, provide them? So um, that, that's a, 
a little bit of what I was talking about. <coughs> so we will be providing them with uh, a minimum of 12 hours uh, support in terms of mentoring and, and, and workshops uh, around those, those barriers to, to growth which I mentioned. So talent, funding, um, marketing and sales, and, and then how they uh, look at branding them themselves. So. Are you working with the um, Federation of Small Businesses? We, we have regular dialogue with, with, with the FSB um, and we're work, working closely with, with City Hall in terms of the growth hub that they have set up, which is an online um, business support tool. So we think our business growth <coughs> service is very complementary to, to, to the growth hub. How many small businesses do you think you actually interact with? So uh, currently we have 145 companies on that programme. We've got a target of four, uh, 450 companies being supported by um, 2019. Do you think you'll get to that target? Uh, yeah, we're on track so far. So that's 450 out of how many small businesses in London? We, yeah, we have li limited resources. Yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> thinking of what percentage of small businesses it affected but um, um, despite the business plan proposing spending nearly two million of the mayor's international business program which you touched on earlier there's very little detail about it so can you take us through some of the practical examples of what support you are looking to provide to potential high growth companies I mean you've touched on it a little bit but um, it's very small the amount of information we've been able to gain on this. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, uh, as I said, the, the, the programme is, is there to support um, uh, companies with uh, revenues of £1 million or, or that have significant venture capital funding. Uh, we're focusing on companies in key sectors, so tech, life sciences, uh, urban infrastructure. Um, the programme, as I mentioned, is uh, designed to work on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, so we bring in companies in cohorts, 50 companies at, at a time, so that those companies can, can learn and support from, from each other, uh, but also uh, are provided with mentoring support from companies that are, look, that are already active in, in the markets that they're interested in exporting to. Um, as well as uh, large corporates that have a, have a pres presence in those markets as well, um, and then can provide practical support in terms of um, making them export ready. So in terms of looking at their, their, their marketing uh, product development to, to be ready for, for, uh, for, for new markets. And then taking those companies on missions um, so we ask companies what, what markets they are interested in. We don't. We're not prescriptive in that. And then um, we'll, we'll take those those uh, companies on missions. Um, uh, sometimes in, uh, in in groups of ten to fifteen uh, companies. So uh, and sometimes they're with the deputy mayor or, or the mayor. So the mayor will be taking um, a group of companies to on his trip to India later later this year. Uh, the mayor took. Uh, a trade mission to Paris on Eurostar um, a, a few weeks weeks ago, um, so uh, and then we, we will we set up matchmaking um, meetings with those companies in, in market. Uh, clearly, the the benefit of travelling with the mayor is it gives them exposure as 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 as, as, as well. Um, those companies travelling internationally also help with our foreign direct investment. Um, uh, remit because they, they are showcasing the, you know, s uh, some excellence in terms of, of SMEs and fast-growing companies in terms of their, their, their technology and showing the, the, you know, what, what great businesses we, we have, in, have in London. How many um, larger businesses then do you think you're interacting with? Well, these are still sort of scaling, scaling businesses. Um, so to date, we've... Uh, Supported 340 companies um, uh, over those 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 six cohorts, and the seventh one cohort is, is launching this month with another 52 companies on that program. Okay. So do you, so do you, so. Do you interact with the real micro businesses? 
Uh, we, we support companies that, that are startups in, uh, so for instance in our office we run an incubator for tech companies in the travel and tourism space, so um, they will be very early stage companies in terms of... So you know, gave a rough idea of how many micro businesses, how many do you think, very roughly? It, it wouldn't be a huge, a huge number. Um, I mean, a lot of the, because most of our interaction is, is foreign businesses coming in, um, quite often they're, they're setting up fairly small operations here in the, in the first instance. They may be larger corporates o overseas, but they often are setting up sales and marketing operations, which are pretty small with a, with a few people. Okay. Well, what's the actual funding for, you, for your company to actually look at all these businesses, to specifically interact with businesses? So um, for this year, I think uh, in in total, there's about seven seven million pounds of activity, which is which is focused on on business engagement. Both. Seven million out of that budget, out of a budget of twenty four. Twenty four million. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, are there any central government or local authority schemes that operate in the same space? Um, if so, how do you avoid duplication? Because so, uh, the Department <coughs> of International Trade has a national remit in terms of um, supporting trade, trade and investment. We work very closely with <coughs> with them and their their particularly their their teams in in market overseas. Um, we also have overseas offices in in certain markets, uh, and in those markets we work work closely with with the DI teams to make sure. That IT teams to make sure we're not duplicating in terms of going after the same company. So we will sh share um, lists of leads, etc., uh, and make, making sure that we're 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 not duplicating. Um, with the boroughs, actually, our business growth program um, has an element in terms of working very closely with with the boroughs um, in helping them to develop propositions to uh, attract foreign direct investment. So we're helping them in terms of capacity building, in terms of looking at the propositions for, for their boroughs. Um, and we can then benchmark in terms of whether those, those offers are sort of internationally competitive, whether they'd be attractive to, to foreign direct investors looking to, to set up. And how many boroughs are you working with? Uh, pretty much all of them. Really? And what's, what's the difference between the kind of support work and what the LEAP um, the London Economic Action Partnership is supposed to be doing? So, um, the, the LEAP has set up the, the Growth Hub, <coughs> which is, is, is mainly for SMEs. It's uh, predominantly an online service. I suppose what we're, we're, we're more focused on international companies um, uh, or companies that are either uh, looking at, at, at trading or, or coming here to, to set up. Um, uh, so I think that's that's the main difference. So I don't think we we, we duplicate our, our, our activities. You don't think you do? Yeah. No. no. Uh, well, so a question to Rajesh. Uh, you're also the deputy chair of the league. Um, are you not concerned that there's a duplication um, as you're spending money from two different organisations? Are you no, quite the, convinced that you're not duplicating any of the work? I'm very convinced we are not duplicating the work. In fact, the work is quite sort of complementary. Uh, the micro businesses you talked about earlier on, the SMEs, we are reaching uh, to them through Growth Hub, which is an online portal, uh, which is a signposting website. I mean, when I started my own business, um, there's a huge problem. Whilst there was help available, you didn't know where to go for help. Uh, and I think a lot of small businesses are in the same space. When you're starting out, you don't know where to go for help. Uh, so it's a great signposting website. Um, uh, looking, you know, if you're looking for a co-work space, etc. So it's a very, it's supporting London businesses to thrive here, uh, small and medium size. Whereas um, the the MIBP program is more for helping them export, and it's designed for fast-growing businesses, what we call as the scale-up businesses. Also in the growth hub, we conduct a lot of offline things. So for example, you may be a small restaurant, uh, but uh, you can take advantage of social media these days, but a lot of times small businesses, small restaurants, they don't know how to use social media for business purposes. Um, so we conduct master classes uh, across London in different boroughs, uh, explaining them how to use internet. For, that's just one example. 
but there are a lot of different master classes to help small businesses. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there is a concern that has to be foremost because Andrew mentioned the growth hub in the work um, that he's doing earlier, and we're also saying that the LEAP does it. Now, you're on boards for both of these. Clearly, if there's um, um, a public money going into these, we want to make sure that it's not duplicating because it's a waste of taxpayers' money, which, of course, we would be concerned about. Okay, finish. Thank you. Thank you. I'm loving the idea of small businesses, small <coughs> restaurants, having Twitter tutorials um, to get them getting their footfall raised for their businesses. Um, I'm going to bring Fiona in here um, to look at the tourism vision for London. Thank you. Um, the tourism vision uh, uh, document that was published in August, I think, um, said that growth isn't a given. Do you think there's a risk that in the past growth of tourism to London has been taken for granted a little bit? Maybe directly like Rajesh. So you want to that people have taken it for granted that tourism will happen in London in the past, potentially. Um, uh, yes, I mean, tourism is one of the sort of major industry uh, in London, especially very closely linked to the hospitality industry, which is perhaps the largest employer for entry-level jobs. Mm. Um, so when you're 17, 18, 19 year old, a lot of times you, you, know, you, you, you start with hospitality industry and tourism industry. Um, so the, the mayor is very clear, you know, we've got a very, um, we've got a sort of growing tourism market. Uh, recently, um, we've had uh, some events in London, which uh, also which we need to mitigate. Uh, for example, around uh, Brexit and so on, and um, there are a lot of tourists coming from all over the world. But we need to show them that the, that London is open, uh, open uh, for them and welcoming, um, uh, which is very important because there are uh, countries where there is view. Uh, sometimes you know, we need to reinforce that view. Uh, that London is open, especially uh, post-referendum. Uh, that's why the mayor uh, is very keen on the tourism strategy. Also, tourism is very closely linked to culture. Mm. A lot of people come to London because it offers great cultures and museum and a lot of uh, uh, other things. And also, it can be a great equalizer. So, to, using tourism as a tool uh, to promote economy in the outer London boroughs is mm. quite important. Uh, because so far the tourism have been very concentrated around the sort of zone one central London uh, sort of key attractions. But there are th uh, things in uh, and attractions uh, where we can sort of promote and disseminate uh, tourists in the outer London mm -hmm. boroughs, uh, which is quite important. So I, we are sort of working on that. Okay, I might jump about a bit with the questions so if other committee members can um, bear with me because that links to one of the questions we were going to ask about um, the planned spending um, in terms of changes to the marketing plans. I don't know whether, Andrew, you want to come in on this um, because the business plan indicates a significant reduction in planned spending on leisure and tourism marketing. So I just wondered if you could comment, um, either of you, on what changes you're making to your marketing plans and why and then I'll come on to sort of how you're promoting it. Okay, in so, so the, the business plan is slightly misleading if you're taking the, the figures from, from the business plan, looking, comparing leisure tourism spend with last year with this year. Uh, so uh, spend last year is an actual figure, uh, spend for this year is a budgeted figure, and it doesn't take into account, uh, take into account the... Um, value in kind um, uh, spend that we get in terms of augmenting our, our tourism activity. So for example, our autumn season campaign, which we uh, uh, launched in uh, August at the same time when we launched the, uh, the, the tourism vision, which is designed to showcase um, the fantastic cultural events that are taking place in the autumn to encourage more visitors in the autumn season, so um, an off-peak season where we want to drive, drive tourism. Um, a lot of that funding is in-kind funding from, from corporates who will so augment it, can, that. And can that, I, that can is, I just interrupt just to get yeah. clarification? So did previous um, figures that would have been in previous plans, did they incorporate that in-kind spending then? 
Well, it is, it is still incorporated in, in the plan, but it's, it's at a, quite a, a, a modest level, and typically we exceed that level in terms of the actual, actual spend. So I think when, you, when we see actual spend at the end of the year, it will be higher than, than, than what's indicated in, in the business plan. So we, we, haven't, we haven't effectively okay. cut our, our tourism budget. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, we might want to double check. When will you have the end of year figures then on that? Um, so they will be in our annual uh, accounts, which will be in July next year. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, and um, so how are you actively promoting the attractions we found in the Outer London Borough as well? Just you mentioned sort of Outer London as an issue. So what, what actions will you be specifically undertaking to actively promote the attractions in Outer London? So, so there, uh, there are a number of things we're, we're looking to, to do. Um, so the, the research that we undertook in, um, uh, as part of the work for the Tourism Vision, which was the largest uh, survey of visitors in the, in the last decade, so we um, talked to over 4,000 4, um, visitors across 11 markets, uh, which looked at the range of satisfaction factors um, and what drove visitors, and actually visiting um, outer London uh, was one of the key areas uh, which uh, led to, to satisfaction. So we, we have increased satisfaction, so we have focused more on, on that um, uh, by showcasing more areas on our website, visitlondon.com, which gets 28 million unique visitors a, a, a year. Um, and so we, we now have profiles of areas of London such as Brixton, Greenwich, Tooting, Shoreditch, Stratford, Croydon, Hampstead. Um, and they've so far had around two and a half million page views since their launch in 2016. We've got new areas which are coming on stream um, shortly. So Kingston, Pont Thames, Peckham, Highgate, Notting Hill and Walthamstow. Um, and then these London areas on our website are complemented by our new visitor app, which we launched last year, which is designed to help guide um, visitors once they're in London, showcase what London has, has to offer. Um, and there is a lot of content on that app, such as secret places um, you need to see, uh, and um, uh, a lot of listings such as Broadway Market in Hackney, Sion House in Brentford, the Hornemoon Museum, um, etc. Et so um, the other thing we, we have done uh, in the last couple of weeks is launched uh, a new mobile game uh, which is designed to um, showcase uh, London. Um, so it uh, features Mr Bean, it's called Play London with, with Mr Bean. It's a free-to-play game where players move through levels based on London areas and interact with selected sites and attractions. Uh, the more they play the game, they can then download uh, vouchers um, from sites in, in both central London and outer London. So it's, it's to... How's that promoted? Because um, I think all the Assembly members around the room looked a little bit like that was the first time they'd heard about the new app. Um, so I just wondered, how's that being promoted? Is that being promoted to Londoners as well as to incoming tourists? Or how would people find out about the app? Uh, the, the app is on... It, it, it's, it's highly rated on, on the... Um, uh, iTunes and, and, and Google Apps, so it, it, it comes up if you're interested in an app in terms of tourism in, in, in London, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's top of the, the list there, so it's... it's, it's okay. Um, Could Londoners play these games? As, I mean, is it for Londoners yes, as well to get yes, these vouchers? And, de de yeah. de definitely. So our, our partners benefit from it. So this, this is at no cost to, to, to London partners. We've partnered with... Um, it's been. <laughs> with with this, this, Mr. Bean, uh, so Andrew Mulshine, who owned the rights to Mr. Bean and, and the company who's developed the, the game. So we think this is the first time a city has launched a game of this, this nature. So we think that's an innovative way in terms of showcasing London. We'll all have to try that then. Um, so, um, and um, does your marketing in London to the emerging markets of China and India differ from your marketing efforts to Europe and North America? From a tourism perspective? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have focused most of our efforts on um, the core markets of Europe and USA to date. Because we have limited amounts of, of funding, um, 
we have, I suppose, focused our efforts in terms of where we think we will get the best, best return. Um, so uh, China is a, is a market which, where we see potential significant growth over the, the, the next few years. So we're looking at potentially 100% growth from Chinese visitors by um, 2025. So we are now beginning to look at that market in the best way in terms of so our, our, our strategy at the moment is, is considering the best way to, um, to, to tackle that, that market. Okay, and obviously currently Europe and North America are, are visa free um, and um, people coming from China may come to Europe and sort of go for a Schengen visa and how, how big a problem is uh, visitors in China sort of going for the, getting the Schengen visa and skipping the bit where they have to face additional bureaucracy by getting an additional visa to come here. So it, 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 it is an issue. It's it's a reason why Paris gets more Chinese visitors mm. than, than, than than we do. Um, I think the Home Office is looking at um, um, making that that simpler. Um, so in terms of having the same processing centres. For Chinese visitors to go to for their Schengen visa and, and their UK visa, so they can do that in 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 in, in one process. Mm. So there are steps being being made to to, to ease ease that, um, um, and clearly for for some high high net worth or high spend Chinese tourists, it's not the cost yeah. of the visa that's putting off, off it's the ease of act of. Yeah. of, of and so going back to the app, is the app also available in other languages such as Chinese, for example? Not currently. No, no. okay. Um, uh, I, I just sort of, that was, that was just a sort of um, added question. Apologies for going off, <laughs> going off script, but I'm quite interested in the sort of the, the, the marketing um, yeah. initiatives. Um, and do you actively connect with other UK promotion bodies so that visitors to London are encouraged to explore other parts of the UK and vice versa? I mean, we quite often go on YouTube and see yeah. adverts from Visit Yorkshire and places like that. Yeah. If, what, what partnerships do, do we actively have to make, make sure that happens, um, but also make sure we get visitors the other way as well? Yeah. So we're very keen to, to use London as a springboard to the rest of the UK and we work very closely with Visit Britain and others to, to do that. So our autumn season um, campaign um, uh, received funding from the Great Campaign um, to, to augment that and you know, I think Visit Britain certainly see that showcasing London is, is a, of a benefit to, to the rest of the UK. We've actually uh, just uh, run a pilot with the Discover England Fund, which uh, has been looking at developing packages for London and Manchester, um, so focusing on long-haul markets, and this was initially targeting um, visitors from the Gulf, so encouraging them to fly into London and out of Manchester and developing mm. bookable product um, that... Uh, they could benefit from. So we worked with one of the largest tour operators in, in, in the Gulf, uh, a company called Donata. Uh, that pilot program ran from February to um, April um, with packages available to buy until uh, September. And Donata saw a 30% uplift in bookings both to London and Manchester compared to, um, to the same time last year with, without that, that intervention. So, um, on the basis of that, we were invited to bid for additional funds, so we're just waiting for confirmation of, of that additional funding from Discover England to extend that uh, programme to more areas of the UK, so potentially looking at uh, Birmingham, the Cotswolds, Lake District, working with Manchester uh, again, um, and to additional markets, so looking at potentially China and India as, as potential markets for that as well. And so how many visitors to London come here for the weekend and how many people come here for, for longer? So sort of, in terms of visitor numbers is fine, but it's actually the number of days you've got a visitor in London who's paying for hotels or restaurants yes. or attractions that actually sort of brings money into the economy. Yes, I can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I can get back to you on, on, on It'd that. It'd be interesting to know the average length of stay of... Of visitors to London tourist visitors. I think it's around three, three to four days. So long haul visitors, it's typically eight, eight days. Short haul, I think, is two, two to three. So right. including okay. weekend breaks are, are very popular for, with domestic visitors. Yeah, thank you. And then um, uh, your satisfaction survey, because obviously we want people to be um, happy with their visit to London, indicates that seventy nine percent of visitors to London are highly satisfied with their stay. 
the culture um, culture's been mentioned, obviously. Yeah. Um, what aspects of London experience particularly do our visitors rate highly? Um, so I think it's what, what that 79% demonstrates. It's, it's the overall package of, of, of London's, the mm-hmm. overall experience, which um, they really rate. So because that 79% is, is significantly higher than any of the indi- individual components, so coming here for an event scores at sort of 68%, culture 67%. Um, so it is, it is the overall Lon- London experience, it is the culture, it is coming here to shop, it is coming to go to the theatre, it is going off the beaten track, it's exploring our parks and waterways, um, uh, you know, har- hiring a bike, um, taking a river trip. Um, uh, so you know, th- those are the things that, 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 that score highly. And there are some areas which we could potentially improve. So, interestingly, food was an area that scored um, lowest in, mm. in, in, in our survey. So I think there's, there's an area we can do in terms food of... Food scored lowest? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, th- I think I'm always surprised how much the myth about food in the UK continues. Because I think in terms of food offer, um, it's definitely something that I think it would be good... To sort of continue to try and promote because I think London's got an incredible food. Yeah, uh, I think it has. So I think there are a number of factors there. I think there's a sort of perception lag that um, uh, a number of markets haven't really got up to speed that actually we do have a fantastic food food offering now. Um, we think there's a particular issue in terms of not fantastic food near tourist hotspots. Yeah. So actually, people who research their food offering are very satisfied, but most people don't. And they're just wandering around. So they get overpriced under sort of quality food. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that that actually sort of um, probably makes sense. And um, my reaction to sort of seventy nine percent of people being highly satisfied um, leaves the question: Why are the twenty one percent not? <laughs> what What is it about the experience for those, um, albeit a, 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 a minority? Um, what is it about their visit to London that they raise as, as issues? <coughs> I mean, cost cost is the biggest one. Um, I mean, London is an expensive city. We can't really do a huge amount of, uh, uh, about that. Clearly, the, the, the pound is, is helping with that mm-hmm. at, the, at the moment in terms of it being sort of 20% cheaper for, for a number of, um, of, 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 of markets. Um, overcrowding in certain places, making... Uh, it's a, um, a less attractive experience, and that's something we want to do more about, and that's part of the rationale for spreading tourism both during the year, during the day, focusing more on the nighttime economy, um, um, and then spreading tourism across London as, as, as well. And we're talking to TfL in terms of how we can ease congestion in certain, um, certain areas of, of the, um, the tube network at certain times by encouraging visitors to, to go to different places. And um, is that one of the key recommendations about how you'd improve or sort of sustain high visitor satisfaction rates? And what other recommendations would you have for the, for the industry and actually also sort of obviously organisations like TfL? Um, so I think um, we're, we're working closely with TfL. A lot of it is about better information provision. Um, so it's um, providing clear information for people, particularly how to get around London and how they can get to some of these out, outer London areas. And that's the part, the key, the key barrier, I think, for people mm. to go even further afield. They don't know how long it's going to take them to Greenwich, what they can do there. Are they going for a couple of hours? Is it going for half a day? Uh, how long is it, can they get back to their pub? their theatre trip in the evening so I think it's 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 much more about uh, better information digital information so again that's one of the reasons we created the app to 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 help with that yeah okay thank you and um I think Rajesh you mentioned the um publication of the draft culture strategy later this year um what input um has London Partners had into the document we work very closely with London and Partners. Um, <clears throat> apart from me being the uh, chair, we've also got some GLA observers on board, mm-hmm. including the deputy mayor for uh, culture uh, on, on, on the board. 
um, as, as an observer on uh, LNP. So we've worked uh, very, very closely with them. Okay, great. Um, and um, Andrew, to what extent does your own business plan look to encourage grassroots culture and economies? So, um, I suppose what we're trying to do is, is balance clearly the, you know, the, the, the blockbuster attractions are on the must-to-do list um, for, for visitors. So we do lead with those, but we do showcase a much broader offering on our, on our, um, our digital channels as, okay. as, as well. So our autumn season you know, focuses on, on some of the great things to do, like uh, uh, you know, the blockbuster exhibitions, but also talks about some of the, the, the smaller exhibitions that are taking place at small galleries across London as well. Mm. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to go back very quickly back to the app thing because I think it's quite an interesting aspect of um, most people, um, she says very sweeping statement, would okay. sort of look at TripAdvisor reviews. Yeah. So do they help or hinder the growth of sustainable tourism in a city? That's, that's a big question. Um, and how would an app um, about Mr Bean sort of compete in terms of getting a different message across potentially rather than just going on the weight of numbers who are putting in reviews? So I suppose what, what we can do is, is focus our activity and our content on our app and on the game on areas that we want to showcase, whereas clearly TripAdvisor is, is showcasing everything. So we can shine a spotlight on some of those outer London areas, both on the app and, and through, through the game. Um, so you know, encourage people to see more, more of London, um, whereas you know, commercial enterprises will be more focused in terms of showcasing that what's going to give them their biggest biggest return. Yeah, OK, thank you. And then very, very finally, apologies to the chair, um, um, with hospitality and tourism, obviously it is entry level work in a lot of cases. We get a lot of people from overseas coming to work in hospitality in, in industry. There's still an issue with low pay, and obviously this week we've seen the London living wage rise to over £10 for the first time. Um, does London and Partners have a role in promoting better paying conditions within the within tourism and hospitality and, and what would that role be? So um, we have certainly talked to the Living Wage Foundation in terms of um, uh, how we could um, spread, spread their, their message to, to the tourism industry in terms of running events um, uh, for, for them. I think that the industry recognised that themselves as part of our consultation with the uh, Tourism Vision, we talked to the Sector Skills Council for Hospitality. Mm -hmm. I think they, they recognise, particularly in terms of the shortage of, of skills and the potential issues around Brexit if, if we don't have um, EU workers here, that, that, that they, they need to look much longer term in terms of career development for, um, for that. And that, that's something that, that uh, People First, the Sector Skills Council and British Hospitality Association are focusing on at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for bringing in the living wage this week. It's a good, good question. Um, Susan, you wanted yes, to so come in with yes, that section of questioning. Um, out of your £24 million um, funding, how much of that is for the tourism budget? So, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. <coughs> So I think it's um, around uh, seven, seven million um, in in our plans for this year. Same as before. Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, with this tourism app, um, if you're promoting various different things around London and giving away vouchers, etc., do whoever you're giving vouchers to, do they give you a, a sum of money? Do they pay towards? Um, being featured on on this app? So we run a partnership scheme um, for, for uh, tourism partners, um, so they, they do generate, that does generate income for, for us. Um, so yes, we will then feature those those, those companies. So you know, we're a public-private partnership. You know, we try to augment our GLA grant so we can leverage that as effectively as we, we can and extend our reach by, by 
having and commercial that funding as well. The twenty-four million you say it does. Money yeah. comes in. Out of interest, how much does it cost to run the uh, London Partners? What's the running cost? What do you mean by the running? As in um, rent rates, uh, overheads, um, uh, wages, etc. Um, so we're we're a people intensive organisation. Yes, um, absolutely. So I would say probably half half of our budget is is focused on on, on staff and running costs. So about twelve million. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, as as an interest, have you, do either of you work with Amy Lame? Yes. Do you what do, what do you actually do with the night are? <laughs> so we've been we've been talking about how we can um, promote the nighttime economy. As I say, it's for one well the the discussions we, that we've had in terms of the, the tourism vision, in terms of um, encouraging more visitors to, to uh, explore um, uh, both London at, at night and as, as well as day. Um, um, other, other, other cities are, are seeing much more for their nightlife, so we're keen to, to, to promote that more in, in London, um, and I sit on the Nighttime Commission as well. Oh, do you? Because yeah. the last time we, ha- we had an interview with the um, gentleman, Philip Colvin, Colvin. Yeah, he hadn't got a commission. He was chair of it, but nine months in, he had no commission at all. Well, it's had its so, first, it's had its so first meeting now. It's first meeting in a year. Oh, lovely. Excellent. I love it when things start to happen, albeit a year on. Well, excellent. So are you the only member of it so far? Or no, no, no. no. <laughs> He's found some others. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Is that it? Um, well, it looks like it, doesn't it? Another excellent. year, you might have had another meeting. It's I suspect exciting. they may have there's had another, another There's another meeting uh, later excellent. this month. Excellent. Double that of what uh, mm-hmm. there was before. Joy, thank, thank you. you. I'm finished. Um, we're now going to move on to look at um, a tourism uh, levy for London. This is something that happens in several uh, other um, uh, capitals acro- uh, across the, across the world. And um, Andrew is going to lead the questioning. Yeah, I mean, there's, no, there's nothing new in the idea. I know the, the London Finance Commission talked about it in 2012, but I remember when I first started politics in 1982 debates this on the uh, uh, Westminster City Council who were at that time in favour of it. So it's been around for at least 35 years to, to my knowledge and nothing much seems to have happened since. So um, have, have you looked at how, I think it's really Rajesh, how, how it might work, it work in London? Well, <clears throat> there are various ideas. As, uh, like you said, it's been around for uh, a long, long time. And uh, it's been proposed by the London Finance Commission too uh, as well. And it's not an unusual proposal. Other cities have it. Um, it's one of the ways we can actually uh, raise some funds and that those funds can then be utilised to boost uh, tourism and other sort of related industries in London as well. Currently, GLA has got no tax raising powers. Um, so obviously we think <coughs> it's a really good idea. And it's not just for London actually, it should be sort of devolved to other regions as well where they are then able to uh, boost uh, uh, the uh, local uh, tourism. In Paris, there is a levy based on uh, hotel star ratings, and in Berlin, it's around 5% as well. Um, so the mayor continues to sort of make, make the case that for London, uh, it can make a big difference. And not, like I said, not just London, but of course it should be devolved. So the real uh, principle is more uh, devolution uh, around this. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's important. I mean, the level at which you pitch it is quite important. I, you know, I was in Strasbourg. Few weeks ago, and it worked out, I think, about two euros a night, which is something you wouldn't really notice, particularly bearing in mind the drop in the pounds is probably a good time to do it uh, because it would be absorbed by the by the exchange rate. Um, so, has, has much thought been done on modelling what the likely revenue would be and how you might pitch it? Well, again, there are sort of uh, various models. I mean, you could even have it sort of voluntary to start with, but the, the important thing is the idea of it rather than just a sort of percentage, the concept of it. Uh, I think first of all, the uh, we, we, uh, London would need more powers to be able to sort of um, uh, impose the levy, um, and I think it it should be really welcome. I think you know uh, most cities have it, and it would just help so much in boosting tourism and other sort of related industries in London. It will make a big difference. Mm. 
There's also a question how it relates to the boroughs. I know when I mentioned Westminster, the real issue in Westminster was the cost to the council of servicing tourism, which was mm. significant, yeah. uh, which was effectively paid for by the what was then the ratepayers of, of, of Westminster. Um, so, have you thought about how it might relate to the boroughs as opposed to GLA? Well, it would be more sort of uh, I think GLA, and then it would be sort of spread across boroughs to give 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 a boost. Um, one of the things mentioned in the tourism strategy has also been which we are not quite at a level, but over tourism there are cities <coughs> in Europe uh, where there is a backlash against tourists, uh, um, you know, because in a way a lot of times public is, um, um, uh, they need to see the real benefits coming from tourism, uh, it's quite important, and I think this would be one of the ways mm -hmm. through which you can raise money and in a way show more to the general public that you know it's directly benefiting them okay you, you mentioned paris and berlin i think what, what other international comparators have you looked at well quite a few new york uh, new york has got it uh, there are quite a few cities around the world that have got I mean, normally um different names but like for example when you're sort of traveling to quite a few cities and you check out at the hotel and the bill you see is a city tax mm -hmm. is called um, so that you see across a uh, lot of places. So most of the sort of big global cities have got uh, some some sort of a city tax. So have you discussed this with the government and what uh, what they say about it? Because presumably they'll need primary legislation to do it. Yeah, it requires uh, uh, legislation to do it and sort of further devolution uh, of the tax uh, powers. Um, and this is sort of part of the sort of wider argument around the sort of fiscal devolution uh, for London. Um, and uh, uh, so I think, and it's now that there are metro mayors in place in other parts as well, and, and the mayor has been saying that it's not just for London, but actually uh, whether it's uh, uh, Lake District or Dartmoor or Manchester, they should have uh, similar sort of powers too. Um, so I think now there's a good opportunity to actually go back to the government with the sort of uh, more sort of metro mayors and make a case for it. What have the government said in response? Are they? Prepared to listen to this? Are they going to do it, or are they saying no chance? <laughs> well, uh, at this stage, there's a uh, uh, there's a sort of lot uh, going on, I suppose, and uh, uh, it, it's part of the sort of wider uh, argument <coughs> around revolution, rather than very specific one. Well, maybe one way to do it is to chip away at it a bit at a time, rather than trying to do the whole thing in one go. One of them? Maybe one way of doing it is to do it a bit at a time rather than try the whole thing in one go, some giant big bang, which they don't maybe less likely to concede. If it means, for example, um, transferring central government tax raising powers to the city, that is a much more difficult thing to achieve than starting something new, which is city based, where the government isn't actually losing any revenue from the centre, which it would be if you had other top sorts of fiscal devolution. Uh, this is again for the sort of mayor and uh, the sort of metro mayors together to uh, now look at it, I think. Okay, so what's the next step? Well, next step is, is just making a, I mean, the, it's been very, very clear uh, that uh, the sort of, uh, <coughs> that London needs more uh, power around uh, this area, especially after uh, Brexit, I think, um, when um, there are things like, so for example, <coughs> right now we get Ironically, a lot of funding for small and micro businesses uh, for um, uh, some of the things that London partners run, actually the money comes from Europe. Um, and that would be under once Brexit happens and we are out of the EU, that funding uh, will disappear. Um, so this, the, this is the time, I think there's a very uh, strong case for us uh, to go to the government and, and talk to them about it. Okay. Do you mind if I just oh, pick yeah, up uh, uh, on this a bit? Because um, I, just thinking, um, I, I, the GLA has done some modelling, um, the, the um, GLA Economics did some modelling on the um, idea of a tourism levy. There's, um, it, it projected that it could raise between 91 million and uh, just over 360 million. So that's big chunks of money compared to Andrew's budget um, for London and Partners. Um, and I'm just sort of thinking about, you know, I mean, you were talking, Rajesh, about the idea of a backlash against tourists and the impact they have on a city, which is absolutely understandable if you think of an area like Camden, where you've got the huge, huge costs of the clean-up around Camden Lock, of having so many visitors 
going there. So, I mean, I just want to dig in a bit more to what could happen to this hypothetical money if one did have a, a tourism levy um, in London. Because, uh, and there are other things that we've heard about on this on this committee um, with the looking at the evening and nighttime economy and the idea of having particularly well trained. Um, staff working in the nighttime economy who are looking out for um, the safety of the people who are um, participating in the nighttime economy. Um, and I just wondered if, you know, if that kind of, you know, if it couldn't be really useful to London to have the idea of, you know, our nighttime economy is, you know, world class because we've got really well trained staff. Couldn't something like a nighttime, uh, uh, like a, 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 a a, a tourism levy actually, you know, provide funding. You're talking about hypothecation, aren't you? I am talking about hypothecation. Thank you. Yes, Tony. Um, but you know, if if you know, could it not make our tourism offer much better um, because that money was being sort of used specifically? It absolutely, absolutely would. Uh, we could uh, make so many. There are so many ideas around it. You know. If you've got that kind of money, um, that can be used in a lot of different ways uh, to support the industry, to support uh, the efforts to bring more tourists in, to support uh, and service the areas where uh, we see uh, tourists to disperse the uh, tourists in other areas, I mean, which we are already doing through LNB, but we could uh, do a lot more. Um, and it just, like like I said, as a principle of it, I think cities should have the, the power uh, around this um, to, to, to have this kind of levy. Um, it's, it, so the argument is more wider. So you are absolutely right. Hypothetically, once we receive it, we can um, use it in a lot of different ways. But the principle of it is is hugely important that uh, uh, sort of going forward, um, that cities uh, and regions have got power to um, uh, raise. Okay, uh, and, and so does, does the mayor agree with you on that? Does he think that a tourism levy would be a good thing? For well, London. it has been recommended on, uh, by the uh, London Finance Commission and mm. London Finance Commission too, um, and the mayor has uh, accepted those recommendations. Yeah. And Andrew made the point that, um, I think very good point, uh, that actually getting something like a, a tourism levy through might be much easier than trying to get complete a complete devolution package. Have you thought about pushing forward on a tourism levy um, sort of separate from the whole debate around devolu fiscal devolution? Well, again, now it's uh, now that the metro mayors are in place and it's not just about London. I think, you know, I, I think it's we should talk around the sort of wider principle and along with other metro mayors, we sort of make, make a case for it. Um, so it's not just a Lon London thing. It would, you know, if it is done in Dartmoor, it benefits them. If it is done in Lake District, if it is done in... Manchester, it benefits them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's uh, sort of collectively uh, making the case as opposed to just for London alone now. Mm -hmm. And um, and then just one other um, point that relates to this. In Amsterdam, I understand that Airbnb collect um, a tourism levy. Um, and we're going to be talking in the second half of our meeting about disruptive technology and um, you know new business models but I'm just wondering if um, you know, w whether you think that Air sort of getting Airbnb uh, organizations like Airbnb involved in something like this would actually help in terms of getting them to put something back rather than simply taking absolutely it. again tourism levy would be applicable <coughs> whenever it comes in on 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 these sort of platforms as well mm -hmm. um, because increasingly these platforms have become quite important uh, and they have to play their own sort of role uh, uh, and and uh, tourism levy would be another sort of way of them giving back uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Susan, did you say you wanted just to... Just very quickly, I'm, I'm just very concerned about this. London is a very expensive city, quote from you earlier, Andrew. I wrote it down when you said it. I agree. Do you not think that... Um, we're in danger of reducing people coming because of costs implications. Well, again, right now the sort of uh, weak sterling is uh, helping. From a tourist point of view, is that your question? From a yes, tourism well, point of view? and us, the people running the businesses to service that industry, i.e. Londoners. 
Um, yeah, so London is, uh, you know, we've got, so there are, there are a number of strands to it. So for example, housing uh, is expensive. That is one of the strands when, when we say the cost in London is high. Um, and that is why the mayor is sort of working on solving the housing crisis we have. Now that also no, brings... No, Andrew was referring to it as being an expensive place to come and be. Um, I'm just saying that we've got to make sure that we don't limit the amount of people coming in for our tourist industry. Surely taxing people, or whatever you want to call it, um, is another way of, of making everything more expensive, and thus would be a problem. It's a euro, I mean, it's, it's a pound potentially a night on a, on a room. Yeah, and it's a little bit here and a little bit there. I'm just saying. I'm asking the question. Yeah, so just to, I mean, respond to that, <coughs> it, it's a very, very small amount. Um, it's something we are not trying to prevent. If anything, our job is to promote tourism, bring more and more. We are, uh, London and Partners is sort of measured uh, on, on that number of tourists sort of coming in and uh, the amount that they're, they're, they're spending here. If you look at Sterling, I mean, it just, since Brexit, it lasts sort of one, one and a half years, it's moved and dropped at 1.15, 18%. Um, um, so that has made it so much cheaper for uh, tourists. So to there you are. You've already found the benefits of exit. <laughs> well, a weak currency is, uh, but equally it's sort of uh, determined. I mean, it's really bad if you are importing, and that's why the inflation yes, yes, has yes, gone yes, up. Yes, I know that. Yeah. I was being flippant from your opening comments. I just think mm. if you're, even if it's a small amount of money that you're collecting, knowing how incapable we seem to be of collecting various taxes without it costing an absolute fortune because it's labour intensive, etc, etc, etc. I just wonder how much money we'd actually get out of it and whether long term it just adds yet more money to the cost of coming to our great city. That was my point. Yeah, I mean, at, at, on a sort of per visitor basis, it would be extremely small. <coughs> so I, I, I think it's uh, totally sort of, uh, it's not going to hamper uh, more or hinder more visitors coming into London. Okay, I hear what I, mean, I mean, just on that point, Rajesh, you, you talked about looking at international comparators. Have any of those other cities you looked at seen a dip in tourism because of a tourist tax? Yeah, I mean, the, the, there are cities that we've done, and that's why sort of GL Economics has done that uh, measure as well. That would it be between, um, uh, so depending on how you sort of cut it, anything between 90 million to like 360 million pounds. Uh, but, can but, be yeah. but looking at the, at the other cities you've looked at, Paris, Berlin, New York, have any of those seen their tourism fall off because of the tourist tax? No. The no. Because it's no, no, there's no sort of, you can't directly attribute towards that. That was my point, I was going to ask. Excellent. In which case, um, uh, can I thank you both for your contributions? And can I also ask the committee to note the report and the discussion with our invited guests? Thank you. We're now going to have a brief break while we transfer to our next uh, next guest. Do I? GLA Committee Room Five Sound. GLA Committee Room Five Sound. GLA. Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, 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 Committee Room 5, Sound. 
GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. GLA, Committee Room 5, Sound. We are resuming our meeting, having had a changeover of guests. Um, and uh, so this brings us to our last discussion item, which is on the role of our Chief Digital Officer. Um, this, the, the key aims of this item are to uh, discuss the roles and responsibilities of the Chief Digital Officer, look at the Chief Digital Officer's priorities and delivery plans, and um, delivering mayoral ambitions around data protection and digital inclusion. So can I now welcome our guest, Theo Blackwell, who is the first, I think, uh, Chief Digital Officer um, here at City Hall. Um, and I will uh, kick off by asking you, um, what is your digital transformation agenda uh, for London's public services? Right, uh, so I'll just explain a little bit about the origins of the Chief Digital Officer role um, and uh, what I see as the, as the way forward. So in the manifesto, the Mayor committed to establishing a Chief Digital Officer. It was a response to uh, a fairly strong lobby from the tech industry uh, and uh, many of the London boroughs to create such a role, to deal with uh, what was, uh, what's perceived to be the coordination deficit across London's public services. Uh, and a need for more, uh, a clearer way to engage in public service transformation. 
Um, there was a paper in 2015 uh, around this, which influenced both mayoral manifestos of the, of the uh, of, certainly of the, uh, the Labour Party and the, and the Conservative Party at, at the time, and that they uh, and both of them had a commitment to a chief digital officer. This is very much influenced on the model created by New York City uh, in 2011 and many other uh, major cities. So. Uh, in the manifesto, you have the establishment of the post of the chief digital officer and a number of other uh, commitments around around the digital agenda, uh, digital public services, cybersecurity, digital inclusion. So with the mandate that the mayor has and the role uh, being created, uh, those are obviously key the key priorities in shaping the agenda uh, as we look forward. So I see them manifested in three key themes, which I've published already on tech.london website. The first is a digital leadership piece, which looks at all of the statutory, non-statutory strategies that are created by uh, the GLA and to ensure consistency across those strategies as they uh, develop. Some of them are slightly out the door at the moment, but uh, nevertheless, uh, there is a, a lot to look at. Um, the key strategies for me at the moment being the economic development strategy, which is in draft form, and also the development of the London plan. But also this sort of bleeds into health and uh, many of the other statutory responsibilities. So what do I mean by strategic alignment? Uh, I mean that when we use the word smart, when we use the word data, when we describe the digital economy, we are all trying, to, we're all, we have a consistency of language and meaning uh, and intent by this. And I think that's really important because it's not just for City Hall, it's how that uh, is read by the boroughs, the main delivery uh, partners for us uh, in many of these areas. And the second part of digital leadership is developing the internal capacity for, for change and under, digital, what Martha Lane Fox calls uh, digital understanding. Uh, and so, as you know, the, uh, the mayor has uh, committed uh, some funds to the development of, of that capacity and uh, plans will be rolled out very shortly on how that would happen within City Hall. The second theme uh, is establishing digital foundations. Uh, and by that, I mean the, the actual glue that gets public services to collaborate on the digital transformation agenda. Uh, these digital foundations at the moment are being researched uh, in the boroughs by a consortium of FutureGov, uh, the engineering firm Arup uh, and Stance, which is headed up by the former Chief Technology Officer of the Government Digital Service, um, Andy Bill. Uh, and their research has talked to chief executives, CIOs um, and service directors in the boroughs to test their um, that what we loosely call the coalition of the willing, those boroughs that are really committed to cooperating on this agenda. I think previous example, previous attempts to get boroughs to work together just by sort of pulling levers and saying this sort of makes sense that you all should procure together haven't necessarily been successful. What we want is to get those boroughs that are already pointed in that direction and see if we can create some kind of function that enables better public service collaboration. The third point uh, is to assist uh, the Deputy uh, Mayor for Business and Technology uh, uh, and team on uh, promoting London as, as a place for the digital uh, economy. And the main vehicles for doing that will of course be London Tech Week, um, which is a massive event. And I think this year there's probably we can do some, some, some real uh, promotion of London uh, as uh, a place for innovation um, and a range of uh, other initiatives that I think are really important. Uh, diversity in technology, um, a major issue for that sector, uh, and also dealing with our, our digital inclusion deficits in London. So those three themes come together in a Smart London plan which um, we're looking to start a big listening, listening exercise at the beginning of, of next year, um, thinking to plant a plan in the middle of, of next year. And that plan won't be a new strategy, because I think there are quite a lot of strategies uh, around, but it will have uh, distinctive uh, uh, actions, deliverables, uh, that will be judged against. 
Gosh, there's so much in there um, that I want to pick up on. Um, the just you were you were talking about um, having a, a, a sort of a common language and intent. Yeah. Um, and as you were talking about that, I was just thinking about the way that w one of the examples. I'm on the transport committee, and we've seen Transport for London be very innovative with the data that they've made available um, to different um, uh, tech companies, but they haven't necessarily had um, kind of public interest or public purpose right at the core of it. So mm. they've allowed a, a huge amount of technological innovation, but we've ended up with you know, the disruption that Uber has caused without, and um, also we've ended up with uh, companies doing really incredible stuff like City Mapper, mm -hmm. making it really easy for us all to travel around London more efficiently yeah. and understand where the tubes are coming. But we're not necessarily, and when the buses are coming, but we're not necessarily getting data back from them so that Transport for London can plan for public purpose the, the, the needs of transport going forward. So I just wonder, yeah. is in that language about intent, is there is that about pub having a sort of public purpose at yeah, the Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we need to be aligned on our objectives. Um, I think there is, th and you know, we're sitting here in City Hall and there are all sorts of relationships that will be slightly different depending on the nature of the organisation that we'll deal with. There'll be some within the GLA family, um, you know, where we will have uh, more authority over and there'll be some which require uh, cooperation such as with the boroughs. That's the sort of nature of uh, our, um, uh, our sort of constitutional settlement here. I think we can learn qu some quite interesting things from abroad because although the uh, mayoralty is, is somewhat different from let's say the mayor of New York or mayor of Chicago, they, they also treat with large delivery, public delivery agencies uh, such as their transportation system or their, or their, their police authority. Um, so to that extent we are looking at how we can partner with the experience of people globally in city government and we uh, last week the mayor announced uh, a partnership with uh, Michael Bloomberg's uh, philanthropic municipal consultancy Bloomberg Associates on how we can get that global experience together to make sure that uh, the way we set out a roadmap uh, for public agencies as well as our boroughs is uh, consistent with what's best uh, out there in the world and what we can learn from it. Specifically with TfL, I've committed to go in there on a kind of a series of immersion days uh, to, um, to get under the bonnet uh, there and um, TfL as an agency will play a, a really important role in the delivery of the Smart London Plan. Not least it is a uh, it, it controls a large um, a set of public assets and um, without really mobilising our public assets in TfL, the NHS and indeed the boroughs um, some of our connectivity challenges won't be met. Did you want to come in? It was, it was on the TfL city mapper sort of um, spectrum. So obviously a lot of people rely on city mapper, a lot of people um, use the TfL app. Um, at, what, at what point does the um, non-public sector, so private sector funding out outperform what we could possibly afford to do in terms of technology. So for example, City Mapper can tell me what platform to get my train from. Occasionally it's a bit flaky about whether the trains are actually going. Mm -hmm. So what, how do you work that sort of conundrum between public sector providing information to consumers and um, travellers themselves and uh, private sector? Whether it's effective or... Well, well basically at what What's the relationship between the two? Because obviously um, uh, you can get very good um, apps. Um, I use CityMap the whole time, for example. But there's always that sort of interplay between the public sector providing information itself, City Hall and TfL providing information in the form uh, that they think customers want and sort of private sector yeah. doing their own thing. Yeah, but we see that. I mean, I think you're right. We uh, to. Uh sort of speculate on this because we do uh, have a dual role as information provider 
uh, and, and service provider uh, in our own right. Um, uh, I think in the, in the first instance we should be looking at much more you know, common standards of uh, data sharing and information right across London's public services as a whole so they can be used for the public benefit uh, and for uh, commercial uh, exploitation uh, should they want. I think there is an ongoing uh, discussion about what the nature of, of uh, private sector involvement you know, should be. Um, and how the data is used and data is shared. Um, so we are guided by the Smart London Board, which was set up before uh, I arrived, um, to discuss some of these uh, issues uh, in more depth. Um, I think the scale of the number of services provided by the public sector is so large that it's quite difficult to to you know to put put down very specific rules that govern everything. An average metropolitan authority, for example, has between 650 and 700 lines of business, the vast majority of which are supported by actual technology. So that could range from something that you're required to do by law through to something that a borough pro provides sort of voluntarily to its residents. Uh, and equally, scoping that in TfL will provide a huge range of services. The first thing that we need to do when we're, kind of, when we're looking at coordination uh, across public services, take a step back and find out really what's out there. Um, because uh, when looked at it through this lens, there is a level of complexity um, which we first need to get a handle on. And I think these debates that you're quite rightly um, pressing on will um, will emerge. Just, uh, I, mean, I mean, that kind of comes back to the sort of how do you, I mean, that relationship between um, independent companies innovating and the public sector um, you know how do you get the best innovation um, it, technologically while kind of protecting the sort of public interest well there's okay there are there are two things one is data is not held or stored or shared in a consistent way across um, our public estates private estates um, uh, across public services so I think the debate around common standards is um, is a growing one and there's a real move towards creating much more common understood standards in data sharing um, in particular I, I think this will this could play out in in the following way um, the London plan is a vehicle for uh, new development um, what if uh, there was a smart proposition um, in in our development frameworks, or uh, and then we can develop further guidance on on those standards. So that with the significant amount of building that's going to go on in the city and regeneration, especially around transport hubs, that we could actually have something that was common uh, that we decided uh, as Londoners, um, so that we didn't have developments with technology that was creating information that was either. Um, not secure or not properly shareable for the public or, or commercial benefit. Um, I think that's a really, really important point and I think that's something that will be, I'm sure that will be something that will be explored in greater detail um, in, the, uh, in the Smart London plan. Thank you very much. Um, Susan, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you. Um, what is your understanding of the Smart City and can you give us some tangible examples of what it might look like? Okay, um, I think the smart city uh, has uh, is a city that, first of all, has some clear objectives about how it wants to use technology. And the example I, or well, the, the sort of story I give here is discussing something with the chief executive about digital as a noun or digital as an ad adjective. And quite often with technology, we've just looked at things as tools. Um, but digital as an adjective allows you to do things faster, be more adaptable, and share more information. Um, a smart city is something which has that at its core. It realises that there are, um, there are tools by which you can gather more information in order to make better decisions, whether through AI, human judgement, augmenting professionals in order to do things. A smart city allows you to plan better, an area like uh, a city like London, with its tremendous growth, enables us to plan school places, it enables us to plan traffic flows, it may enables us to do better development. Um, 
for the benefit of Londoners. So fundamentally, a smart city is something that's able to be a data-driven uh, city with uh, enough people uh, uh, able to you know, plan for the needs of, the needs of Londoners. I don't think there's any city in the world that has um, become a truly smart city and partly this is the challenge of retrofit <laughs> because you've got uh, new developments coming along and then you need to go into uh, look at old districts uh, and see what their needs are and, and, and uh, uprate them. Um, but if you look at the leading smart cities, those are the ones that are going down the road of common standards. They're saying that technology should be, uh, the, the way in which uh, data is shared should be uh, agreed upon, uh, and uh, there should be more data sharing uh, between the various uh, technologies that you, you do use. In London, I think it's very clear from the mayoral strategies that there are, that there are things that technology is required to do to help Londoners now. That's our fight against poor air quality and, as I mentioned before, infrastructure planning. Uh, on the issue of poor uh, air quality, we don't have a... Uh, we, we have a growing data set there, but we've just announced a, uh, a tie-up with the Alan Turing uh, Institute to enable greater data sharing between the increasing number of data collection points. The more data we have, the better judgment we're able to give on things. Uh, and I think that's really, really important um, first step. So all of these things will have a practical application. They're not just words and, and phrases and things like that. All of these things must have a practical application to benefit London. Okay. Um, you said it must have clear objectives. If I said to you, then in your opinion, the most important <coughs> objective, which clearly you're going to be working towards because that's what you've been put in charge of. What, what can we judge you on if I said to you what is your most important objective? My most important objective is to help solve, is to solve the collaboration deficit across <coughs> London Public Services to enable us to better our uh, uh, sharing of data so we can make better public judgments on public policy. Okay, thank you, that's clear. Um, how will you work to ensure that new disruptive technologies benefit society? Um, yes, well, as I alluded to before, I mean, it sort of, you know, it sort of depends what you mean, because there are a whole range of um, different areas in which technology could be a benefit to Londoners. What we'll certainly do uh, and this was announced by the mayor at the Wire, Wired conference, is we will put our backing uh, behind new GovTech scale-ups, uh, put them in front of investors, uh, and uh, to see whether their ideas can, at, at first stage, uh, attract more finance. Secondly, we will creates a collaborative network in London between the authorities, the Coalition of the Willing, as I uh, mentioned before, so that we can create a clearer framework or a clearer way in which the best ideas can be adopted, not just by one authority, but more authorities. Um, previous to uh, coming here, I worked for a GovTech startup, so I've seen it from the other angle on how hard it is for ideas to be adopted by the public sector um, and other infrastructure providers. And I think that's one of the key challenges of this role and how we create a much more common playing field so that the best ideas created by the tech community can be adopted by the public sector. Um, it, will you um, almost have a sort of like a risk register within your department as in you bring in a massive view of technology to this? You just feel this this service. What sort of an impact that will have on those already? I mean, you mentioned Uber and black cabs as as a very rough example. You know, if you bring massive technology into one aspect, will there be people that um, will or businesses that will suffer from that? Do you do you acknowledge that, and do you are you going to be keeping an eye on that? Because well, I think I mean when I was uh, at uh, when I was at Camden before I, uh, I I I got the job here, 
um, I was a big proponent of what I, I kind of dubbed an a- active digital policy, which was keeping an eye, not seeing digital just in terms of service transformation, um, you know, put things online and forget about the impact. We needed to make sure that uh, we had a much wider view of the changes that were going on in society, and so that's why I think investment in skills is extremely important uh, during this period. The Mayor's outlined a £7 million digital talent programme, which is a model which is actually being looked at by other combined authorities, I know, uh, at the moment. Um, support for things like teacher training or for, for the next generation of computing teachers, linking them up with universities. So we make sure we've got skills flow right from an early age onwards is fundamental. So government can't um, can't uh, promote, on the one hand, uh, disruptive technologies without looking at sort of human pipeline and making sure we've got the skills ready for the future. There's there's a there's a lot more work to be done in this area, but I think there's a, before I came there was a very very good, good start being made here on this. Thank you. I bring Andrew in now on your yeah. priorities um, yes. and delivery. What resources have you got? Um, so I think my job comes in two phases. Um, one is the sort of institution building part, um, as I outlined in my three themes. Uh, the mayor said to me um, that uh, when, when, I was, uh, when I was appointed that I should just go out there and um, you know, find, set out the plan and find the challenges. So at the moment, uh, where I sit is on, on, the, on, the, on the eighth floor. Um, and I'm supported by the GLA. Um, I think it, as we move towards the the second phase uh, uh, down the road, if the case is made, um, then there'll be, you know, I think probably you know the case for more direct support, um, as per what's happened in other major cities such as New York. So you think you're pretty well on your own at the moment. I don't feel on my own. <laughs> I think it's a. Uh, I think the case with anything new, the case needs to be made about effectiveness. It's public money, and so what we need to do is make sure that. Um, I think uh, at the at at the start, and we are in sort of strategy making season, aren't we? Um, so at the start, that things are aligned, and I think quite a lot can be done with you know not not a huge amount of investment at the start. I think it will become clear as London's challenges become clear where we need to reorder our investment, and I'm sure you know the committee will play a role in that. Yeah, I think you, you said that the Smart London plan is going to come out next year. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. 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 Middle of next year. Right. Okay. And, and, and you're writing that presumably with the Smart London board. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we've also got the London Office of Technology and Innovation. Where does that fit in? Yes. Yeah, so. When I went through the, um, my three themes, the digital foundations included the work by Future Group Gov, Arup, um, and Stance, and that is to test the proposition for a London office for technology and innovation. Now, um, what an office is, uh, is yet to be worked through. We're doing so sort of as we speak, um, but it certainly would be a function which um, would call on the resources not just of City Hall but of the boroughs because it's a joint operation uh, in order to do that and what we would envisage is having uh, maybe a a small number of expert staff uh, uh, given the time and capacity to bring uh, the boroughs and some of the other public services together in order to provide that kind of common platform so that some of the best ideas from the tech sector can be adopted. And all all the the boroughs signed up or? No I think I think uh, um, oh, we're not at the stage of signing people up, are but we are, we are in the stage of identifying who, who the coalition of the willing and the able yes. are, if you like. Yeah. Um, and I, I think if we start, start small um, uh, with those people who are willing to commit the time and resource, and to a certain extent it's more about time, it's like how, how you take a, you know, a good service director or a CIO off their main work and maybe give one or two days to this function. Um, you know that's kind of what we're we're looking at. Uh, I think I think even before the research showed that there are probably about ten or eleven boroughs who 
fit that description um, and uh, are really w willing to experiment. I think it's interesting because across the country, pretty much, uh, you know, not, not one combined authority has a full coalition of the willing. And I, I think you'll see sort of intra-regional working on this agenda. I mean, there are, there's a very, very good growing group no, of technologists. Not unwilling. Sorry? You talked you yes. several times, the coalition of the willing and the able. Are you suggesting there's a bunch of Luddites out there who don't want anything to do with you? No, there's, there's people who will do things in, in other ways. Um, there will people be already under contract, for example. Um, with big providers. There'll be some that don't see it as, as part of their key priorities. So they're not unwilling, they're unable. Well, in, in the, our, res our research is, is, is going through this. I mean, there are, there are some people who do not see digital collaboration across, you know, a region as their Can key priority. Can you any guilty men in London? <laughs> um, well, our research is going through. I mean, it's, the, the whole point is not to. It's, it's, this isn't. If I give the impression of like sort of naming and shaming, it's not that because I think the wor the, the worst thing you could do in um, <coughs> uh, if you were trying to create something which was which is a new institution for London is to sort of is to create some sort of league table. I think that that puts people's uh, sort of noses out of joint and doesn't get the intended result. I think if you started on a 32 borough basis, I think some some boroughs that are more um, down the road than others might feel that they're not able to innovate at the speed that they want to. So the challenge here is to create an institution which uh, provides uh, a, a really solid foundation for those um, that um, want to progress at speed and then makes it it easy for people to say yes I want to be part of that but it can only work if it proves effective if you see what I mean so so that's the challenge so of this that's, institution. That, so that's really your job your job is this kind of missionary isn't it that you go out from here preaching the word uh, saying that this is a good thing because a lot of us I speak as a, uh, as a Luddite <laughs> a lot of us thought this was a bit of a gimmick. Chief Digital, oh, that sounds a bit 21st century. Oh, but he's not really going to do anything. We're in the 21st century. Yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, for the record. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, if I think, you know, this, this sort of goes in. I, I was a local councillor for 15 years, and so I experienced all sorts of ways in which. Um, uh, boroughs collaborated and uh, I think it's probably and I think whatever way you do there's always be a criticism if it's 30 if someone says we've got to do this on a 32 borough level someone will say well how, how can you possibly do it that way that's not the most effective vehicle for this um, the way in which it's it responding to the demand of innovators within public services there was a feeling that let's start off with the proposition of those people who um, who want to collaborate more but don't have the authority uh, to do so um, what's uh, and prove this by use cases so we will be setting out a series of use cases for example all boroughs will face significant challenges over cyber security is it right or and GDPR or compliance with new data laws is it right that we do things in 32 ways or can we can we narrow that down and say okay maybe we can do this in in three different ways or four different ways depending on people's appetite and I think it's really important to respect uh, you know borough's priorities in that way but there are it's clear that there are a number maybe 10 maybe 11 that um, do want to move ahead uh, at pace but the aim is not to be an exclusive club. It's to say you can join uh, on on any issue that you want if you feel the need. So if it's needs Europe driven. Like that, Sorry. If only Europe was like that. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Saying, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and one, one thing I, I wanted to raise with you, with you Theo, is is um, rollout or lack of it of high speed broadband. Is, is that part of your job as well? Because he we didn't really talk about making high-speed broadband available throughout, throughout mm. the capital. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing our economy, particularly yeah. the way we're going at the moment. 
I think one of the roles of the, I mean, certainly connectivity will be mentioned in the Smart London Plan, but it's also mentioned in economic development strategy and the work of um, the, um, the Deputy Mayor's, um, uh, Deputy Mayor for Business. Uh, so, you know, there are, there are, it is already embedded in a lot of what the GLA does. Turning back to this London Office for Technology and Innovation, there are ways in which um, better coordination can assist boroughs seize opportunities to prepare for the rollout of 5G and to tackle not spots because many of you're dealing with many of the same players. So, so I mean, I suppose the monopoly is, 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 is you, you bang the heads together to make it happen. Um, or, or provide assistance. For, yeah. for example, can well, I give you one? Well, example? I'm going to give you an example. Yeah, and okay. then, then you can tell me. I mean, I, I, mean, I think. BT Openridge has been a bit of a break on our economy, the way they've gone about some of this. And um, in the summer, some of us are on the Gen Committee met with Committee Five, who I think we're doing work in Camden, mm -hmm. um, who were rolling out high, high speed broadband mm -hmm. for free in terms of paying for it. Obviously, you pay for it in, your, in rental, but installation was free. And one of the things they were saying is, well, we could do this very effectively if we had access to TfL networks under the pavement. They've got networks running the traffic lights across the capital right. why can't they plug into those networks and it's making things like that happen uh, rather than the stodgy bureaucracy that sometimes gets in the way of these sort of things yeah i'm not i'm using that as an example let's say they're the yeah, best people absolutely and and there are plans being developed there is a plan being developed within city hall about connecting london um which will look at uh, not spots full utilization of public assets including tfl um, better Wi-Fi, mobile Wi-Fi and transport corridors, um, helping boroughs develop their own approaches. Now, this kind of goes back to um, the the issue of, of you know, boroughs working together. Um, DCMS has a fund to help prepare for 5G, and part of that is, you know, in order to access the fund, you need to have a, stra a strategy around connectivity. Um, we lack the information at the moment to fully know, I mean, we're, we're working that up at the moment to actually look at how um, how far advanced boroughs are, are on this. Now, a resident of a borough, I'd expect my borough to have some kind of plan, as well as City Hall, about, about this. Can we help boroughs develop those plans? Not forcing people to do so, but we've got knowledge about what other people are doing here. So not sort of uh, just a missionary, but also a uh, repository of information and good practice so we can help people do the right things so they can access money from the government. I think it's a really important role we, ha we have here at City Hall to as a sort of strategic enabler. So will the Smart London Plan include connectivity? It will include, yeah, it will, it will include a, a discussion around connectivity because... Um, you can't be smart without uh, having world-class co connectivity. Also goes into the London plan. Um, you also need to talk about data sharing and you also need to talk about your vulnerabilities as well. Those things all form part of the same package. Andrew, can I move on to Fiona? Thank you. Um, Fiona's going to cover cyber security and digital inclusion. Right. Um, I think I was covering cyber security. Cyber security. Yes. yes, sorry. Okay, Thank lovely. You, um, uh, just wondered when, whether you could tell us when the cyber security strategy will be developed and if you can give us an indication of what the key elements may be. Um, at the moment, I've met, uh, uh, I've met London Cyber Security Centre. I uh, have met with MOPAC, um, who have who've been doing a lot of the running on cyber security and I've been reviewing the draft strategies that that have come out of uh, are coming out of the GLA uh, on this cyber security has many elements there is a sort of public health element to it which is like what a, what risks are citizens um, uh, uh, exposing themselves to there's a there's a business small business element to it do people have the digital skills to protect their businesses from from these things there's a public service angle uh, as we saw with the WannaCry uh, virus uh, in the NHS uh, that uh, and the challenge against public services denial of service attacks happen quite uh, quite often on public services in London we need to make sure that they're resilient um, and so and that sort of leads me to the point it's like identifying what does cybersecurity mean in all of its aspects? 
water or vulnerabilities. And I think crucially, when you talk to cyber security experts or CIOs and public services, how quickly can you recover from an attack? Which is, because I think being able to stop an attack against a dedicated uh, 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 hacker wanting to compromise your system is always going to be extremely difficult. But to recover from it, is something that you need to do really quickly. So those three things forming part of our thinking. I'm thinking at the moment that I'll fold this into discussions as part of the Smart London plan. We can't be a smart city without knowing what our, what vulnerabilities we are and how we recover from them. Um, I, I think it's because because it has an as, aspect because we are rely this this um, city is reliant on the digital economy. It is becoming much more of an economic development uh, argument, a business argument, than it is a policing and crime argument. That's one aspect of it. We need to be able to support businesses, be more secure as part of our work to grow the economy. Um, and that's the case certainly I'm making internally. I think um, that's quite interesting. I've, I'd written down the point about small businesses. Um, um, obviously, sort of the big stories you hear about things like the NHS or Parliament sort of getting hacked and sort of brought, um, causing problems in sort of major ways. Um, but clearly, one of the problems for small businesses is not having a digital presence at all. So, how do you sort of promote cybersecurity among small businesses while not? scare on sort of making people feel too scared to actually start right. getting that sort of first step of digital presence. Yeah, well, Mopax has been doing some great work here which is actually sort of door-to-door -door visits um, and using trade bodies to talk to um, uh, small businesses. I think there's an opportunity with um, certainly those authorities that have uh, business accounts uh, online where people pay their business rates straight through to the, to the council like you do as a citizen and uh, uh, your council tax to use that as a communication tool um, um, I, th I, I also think uh, we probably need to, we, we need to know more information uh, about the digital skills of small businesses in London Lloyds have just done a big piece of research on that which I'm going to meet with them on uh, and consider that. So all of this, I think, is wrapped up in work around the Smart London plan uh, as well. Um, I'm just I'm conscious that there are many dimensions to cyber security, and we've been looking at it from a, a lens of sort of crime prevention uh, as opposed to economic growth, as opposed to citizen protection uh, and public service resilience. So. Um, any discussion around this will be multifaceted and involve a conversation with more than just one sector. Interesting. And then how much of the issue remains around people using very basic, um, easily identifiable, repeated of every single thing they've got a password on? Um, and how much could it how much of a difference would it make if people started taking passwords more seriously? I think that's. I think the increasing risk is is through. Um, I think the increasing risk is people clicking on links that they shouldn't be clicking on from sources that look reputable, mm -hmm. um, and you know there's some very very clever sort of phishing tactics mm -hmm. out there. Um, you know something that looks like a bill from, you know, an online retailer. Um, looks looks totally credible and people click, clicking on it um, can expose people's systems to all manner of pain and um, I've been talking to people about what's called the DMARC standard on how we make sure that um, those kind of attacks can be limited and that's a big challenge for the public sector too because people trust you know things that come from the public sector. Yes, and I've got a couple of questions that I was supposed to be asking that I went off on tangents on, so I'll ask you these as well, if that's okay, Chair. Um, how will you work with, with, I mean, you've oh, mentioned working yeah. with local authorities, um, so how will you make sure that the information they hold digitally about London is safe and secure? Um, I think authorities do a, I think there's, a, there's probably a, there's a gap in, through cultural uh, and administrative reasons 
on how people use data in authorities. So data sharing um, and data governance uh, is becoming uh, an increasing part of how public services work. I see some of the um, leading authorities uh, not seeing IT just as sitting with the CIO or governance with the monitoring officer, but data actually sitting with uh, the executive director for people because it's essentially a data-driven exercise. And leading authorities are, are adopting approaches um, similar to uh, some private sector companies where, where technology and data is diffused responsibility across the board um, that runs the organisation, not just um, that's with the finance director who you know, gets, gets, gets a paper from the chief information officer. Um, and so I think, again, going back to building the digital foundations uh, of London, we need to show people how the best organisations that are going through digital transformation are dealing with these challenges on a governance level as well as on a technology level. Thank you. And how will we ensure that data that data that's being collected and used by the corporate sector is not used to the detriment of Londoners? Um, in what in what sense that it's, uh, people... in the sense that obviously data mining is quite big business and potentially people don't necessarily know what data they're giving. Yeah, I, I, there'll be there'll be some debates that are properly um, lawmaking debates for Westminster. Um, we have a role in, and there's an increasing uh, discussion around data ethics, mm -hmm. which we will no doubt have a lobbying and convening role from, from the tech sector. Part of this will be, I think, the, um, this big listening exercise with the Smart London Plan. Mm -hmm. And during that listening yeah. exercise, I anticipate people asking questions like this. But I see this role um, as city administration. And I'll bring the experience of city administration and the use of data and how we deal with the private sector to bear in the national discussions that are that are starting in Westminster. Um, but as you know, we we don't have the powers to do so um, on a London-wide basis. Thank you. Um, we are due to finish in like three minutes. Are people okay if we overrun by about five or six minutes? Um, Andrew, I just wanted to come back to yeah, the, the point you're making about MOPAC and the Digital Security Centre and the door-to-door -door visits, because I went with Linda Digital Centre around East Finchley a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I saw that on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> knocking, knocking on the doors. And, and two or three things came over to me. Number one, when you're call, calling on professional organisations, solicitors, accountants, and so forth, they were very well clued up and all that. Um, the smaller businesses, the traders and so forth, were not. And they were very pleased to see us and work with them and do the questionnaire and so forth. But what struck me more than anything was how little people actually knew about the risk and more importantly how few people knew about the Digital Security Centre services. So how can we, I mean, and we can't knock on every door in every high street because there's just too many. So um, how can we try and make sure that that availability of advice is spread more widely so people aren't taken by surprise when you turn up on their doorstep with a, with a, with me, a police officer, to prove you're genuine, and um, somebody from the Digital Security Centre. Well, absolutely. I mean, I sort of refer you to one of the ideas I heard from um, uh, a former colleague, as I sort of said, said before, was actually using the, bus the normal business rates communication um, to, to businesses with uh, mess advisory messages. I think there's a great role for um, business improvement districts be, who, regu who are a trusted source of regular communication through to businesses uh, in the area. Um, but both of those speak to my point that this, it can't just be, you know, as it were, a, a policeman uh, turning up on the doorstep um, of a business, knocking on doors. On, we, we, we just won't get to those, those levels of businesses. We need to see it as a crucial part of economic development here. So hence I've been pressing really hard for it to be part of our strategic outlook when we talk about thriving businesses and good growth uh, in, uh, in this city. Um, the, uh, as, as sort of, um, as alluded to, it's a complex area 
and we're beginning to get the evidence about what works. Um, there are obvious vulnerabilities that arise when you're going through a massive period of digital transformation and disruption, and it's and it's very much the role of, of government to make sure that people are safe and well advised here. It is not immediately clear um, until we, until we see it in its complexity what the most effective tools for doing that will be, but we need to work on it. And it's uh, it, it's um, really helped by the fact that it's in the manifesto. Um, final uh, questions on digital inclusion. Right. The GLA has signed up to the government's digital inclusion charter um, from last year. Um, what would you say are the defining features of digital inclusion and what is the role, the role of the mayor in relation to digital inclusion? Um, so digital inclusion, um, I, uh, I, I very much am sort of influenced by the approach taken by Baroness Lane Fox and Dot Everyone uh, on basic digital skills, which have five different uh, aspects to it. I think in terms of connectivity, there's a clear issue there. If we want to say connectivity and digital inclusion, or work around not spots, it is clearly um, very, very important. Um, I think the argument has gone on from basic channel shift to something that's fun more fundamental, and I think we'll be increasingly talking about this, which is uh, as the pace of public service reform uh, increases through budgetary pressure and increased customer choice uh, in pe <coughs> people-centred services uh, and the ones which deal with the most vulnerable um, clients, um, adult social care, um, vulnerable families, etc. We will now be looking at service design based around the needs of the user. and. I think a lot of services could be redesigned using digital tools and approaches that enable more inclusion um, rather than less. And so when you're looking at the new work from GDS, they talk about accessibility. It's like, how do you look at yes. government digital services? Sorry. Yeah. So what they're looking at is going really into the heart of a service and designing it from the perspective of the user. I mean, I'm just no thinking comment. about all the people, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a counsellor in Islington, right. all the people who come to my surgery who, uh, you know, don't know how to, don't right. know how to use a computer, sure. don't know how to, even if they went to the library to access stuff online, they just don't know how yeah. to do and it. Yeah, and I had, you know, we've, I've had ample experience of that. I mean, the recent Chalcotts operation uh, as, as a counsellor and the, the numbers of people who couldn't uh, use the internet to book a hotel room, etc., were um, surprisingly high, actually. Um, there will always be a need to provide for those people who cannot use uh, the internet. We do that, though, by really assisting public servants and digitally enabling them to help people more. Identifying those people who are the most vulnerable, which we can do through the greater use of data. Um, liberating public servants from meetings, which are just the product of not having good data sharing and reporting. Um, in many instances, many instances they're needed. And then we can have this all on. They are needed. I know you were on Slack. Um, so the, the, so, the um, um, so there's a new there's a new um, way of thinking around digital inclusion, which isn't just about um, you know, face to, can someone use the internet use the internet or not. Um, which which is now becoming part of the mix. I think there will always be uh, you know elements of face to face in this service because some things can only be dealt with in that way. Yeah. But we need to make sure that the person on the other side is really assisted by technology. Yeah. So, so it's kind of, so even if the people that they're working with are not engaging digitally, the people who are doing the work with them right. have got the full backup yeah. of and digital they, they technology know, they to make them as efficient exactly. as possible. Exactly, and because they know more about the person they're dealing with, more about their needs, 
and also, as I say, quite crucially, that we're designing services using agile techniques, etc., around the needs of the service user, not by proxy. So, so how will you measure success in digital inclusion? That's a really interesting question. I, I'd say that um, adoption of, of things like uh, the local government digital service standard on service design will be, uh, and how many boroughs and public services take that up, will be really, really important because that's at the, the far end. Um, I also think that there are some uh, challenges uh, at a service, service level with boroughs about how you upskill your workforce as well. Um, there are measurements that the government uses on digital inclusion, which you know also come into play. Um, but that in London, I think the figures show that the the numbers of people who are digitally excluded have diminished over the past decade, um, and stand at near the lowest amount in the in the country. There's still quite a few of them, and they do need to be absolutely, looked absolutely. After. I'm, I'm very aware um, of that myself. There's yeah. there's one other area of work that we've been doing as a committee, which is looking at financial inclusion, um, and there's a huge number of Londoners who are paying a poverty premium because they don't have access to um, uh, banking facilities, which kind of links very closely to digital inclusion. I suspect those who are not digitally included are also very likely to be not financially included. Um, I'm just wondering, is there going to be any element of financial inclusion within your work on the digital inclusion strategy? I don't, I don't think so, because I think it will probably fall within the domain of uh, you know, deputy mayors and, um, mm -hmm. and, and ongoing work here. But the one thing I would say about that, if you go back to you know, the, the digital skills that people have, I mean, there are the, the people who, are, who have been digitally excluded who now lack necessary digital skills. And I think the debate slightly sort of shifted in that direction of like, are you using the internet effectively as opposed to have you ever used it? Yeah. Um, and some of the things that go from that is well, what are the, what's the most important thing for you to use the internet for? And if it's having a bank account, the ability to you know, receive benefits, um, uh, and uh, and things like that. That is a really important signifier in all of these things. And I think, as I say, the debates move more towards the effectiveness uh, area. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a whistle stop tour of um, of uh, the whole digital uh, picture, but um, uh, hugely. Um, Interesting. Can I thank you um, for your contributions and can I ask the committee to note the report um, and the discussion with our invited guest? Noted. Thank you very much. And can I ask the committee to note the work programme and priorities for 2017-18, which are set out in the work programme report? Noted. Thank you. And can the committee note the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday the 12th, 12th of December at 10 o'clock? in the chamber at, here at City Hall. There is no urgent business and so that concludes the meeting. Thank you very much everyone.